you. Yar Salim from uh, Brookings Institution. Um, a question or a comment for the first presentation on uh, theoretical foundation of women's empowerment. Uh, one question is how your model thinks of uh, shifting mindset of the destination, the very woman we're trying to help here. Uh, it seems to be more focused on the, lo the role of the uh, community leaders, but what would be uh, the role of uh, shifting the woman or uh, maybe the parents of the girls who are making this actual, the actual decision on FGM. Um, second speaker, I guess, on price. Um, I think it's interesting to look at if you have in your sample those women with zero price. Um, I am an African woman, married, but I chose not only uh, to reject a price, but also the entire institution of having a wedding. But I like to think I am a, an empowered woman. So how would your regression result uh, account for those type of women? Uh, so it would be interesting to look at zero price versus high price and uh, whether which one predicts uh, higher empowerment in your model. Last speaker on uh, um, marital shocks. I found it very, very much interesting. Um, how would you relate with uh, many studies uh, finding uh, using a variable called female, female headed household? And I think it's more general, uh, capturing many of the challenges women have. Uh, if you look at uh, female headed household, I have a difficulty of defining what it is, but it seems that more general in terms of capturing the dynamics there. Thank you. Thank you. And one over here. Hi, thanks for the presentations. I'm Maria from uh, the Overseas Development Institute. I have a question for Sarah. Um, on your, in your regressions, when you use bride's price as an explanatory variable, I was wondering if you control for collinearity because uh, uh, that might explain why other variables that are included in the regressions were not statistically significant, whereas uh, Bright's price was kind of systematically statistically significant. So, thanks. About um, non-payment of bride price in my sample, it just turned out that basically everyone paid bride price, so I, I didn't have people who didn't pay bride price. There were three couples that didn't pay bride price, and then there was a whole story about it and then the families were mad and it was a thing. So <laughs> in general, everyone in my sample had reported playing bride price. And then I'm, I'm not sure, so we present different specifications where we addi like add additional controls, um, but in the like sort of baseline specification, we're just controlling for like age and age squared and uh, education. So I I'm not quite sure what variable you think would be collinear with bride price, but I'm happy to hear more, thank you. I'm not sure if you had a question. I, I couldn't understand the end part of on the female-headed households. Did you have a question, or you were just commenting on the last? I'm not sure if it's a comment or a question, but a female-headed household, uh, at least in economic literature, it's the most, most widely used uh, variable. Also in the HS, you will find it. Um, so... If, if we are thinking of empowerment uh, in line with culture, cultural challenges, like infertility, uh, fear of not being married, are some of the cultural challenges when it comes to Africa. Uh, I, I would say no one would disagree with the challenge with widows. It's universal, not in Africa, but in any setting. It's challenging to be a breadwinner. Uh, so w if we are uh, targeting at changing the norms, maybe female-headed household might capture those individuals, not just widows, but being female-headed household uh, more broadly. Um, I, I'm also doing work on female-headed households, 
But um, the problem with female-headed households is uh, they are a very heterogeneous group. So there are households, you know, of women whose husbands are remitting. There are households of, you know, very badly off women who've been abandoned or widows. Or you know, So it's such an incredible um, array of different households. It's very hard to... You have to, I think it's a useful concept for certain questions and not, not at all for others. Yeah. It's about uh, changing the, uh, what the preferences of the women, what your mindset, huh? this is uh, what you mean. Yeah, I, I think it's a key issue because, uh, uh, you know, unlike what the initial game was saying, I, uh, I think it's, uh, it's too easy to think that... Uh, uh, and even in the bargaining game, that you have the victims against the oppressors, you know, it's a kind of stylized fight. But uh, uh, in hard realities, uh, women have uh, very often internalized the values of the patriarchal system in which they live for such a long time. And my own experience with female genital mutilation in West Africa, especially Senegal, is that the, the real defenders of the female genital mutilation are women more than men. They are more, uh, you know, more active uh, as circumcisers, etc. So you're right that in this case, there is a, a no way out of uh, trying to, to change the preferences of women. And uh, if you look, uh, not in a clear, uh, you know, really directly related to female genital mutilation, which is a very complex problem, but uh, you find that uh, experiences of changing preferences uh, are extremely complex, takes a lot of time. I think one of the most illuminating papers I have read on that is, is a paper, in fact, by Bijou Rao, Sanyal, and Majumdar on the Jivika project in Bihar. But essentially what they show is that it took seven years of a very multifaceted experience in which uh, they had to play on several planes, like increasing women's physical mobility, recasting their identity to various methods, like singing, prayers, John Mee, meetings, etc., uh, and uh, changing symbolic uh, boundaries, and they say, and giving them access to new networks of people. So it's a very long and uh, uh, very complex uh, process. And of course, the question you have to, to raise is, uh, yeah, but uh, how much can we do? You know, you do that in one specific area with a lot of resource and a long of, of time, but how does it percolate and spill over to other communities uh, is, is an extremely complex problem. But there is no shortcut for that. I find the, the elegance of the presentation that Jean-Philippe gave us really quite impressive. But I'm wondering, how do you use theory and empiricism? Which one comes first? Because the model can rationalize anything, almost any behavior that you would like to build into the model. Right? So does it come ex post relative to the empirical exercise? Or do you go to the data with the model as a source of hypothesis that you're going to test on, on the data. So I'm curious as to how you are, you are combining what you derive from theory versus what you get from the empirical work. Right? In the case of food binding and late marriage, one can see that they are sort of natural experiments that can be evidenced empirically, right? As to when the textile came or when the, uh, the, the plague uh, hit different regions of the world, right? But in the, for the first, for the general genital mutilation, where you don't have kind of natural experiments, uh, that I think you, how do you combine, wh what do you derive from empiricism that you're going to take to the data? Maybe surprisingly, I had very much the same question to you, Jean-Philippe. Uh, so I'm giving a little twist compared to, uh, relative to what Alain said. I think that for these models to be really useful in a way. I would have liked to start from what are the assumptions. So verify empirically some of the assumptions that you have, some of the premises, some of the, uh, the context. Is, is, there, uh, is there homogeneous preference or not? Well, let's first know that. And once we have established those different sort of uh, elements of the model, then you can build the model and the games that's being played and see that it produce what you, what, what's the outcome that you observe. But here, it's hard to verify the validity of the model because we don't, we don't verify whether they, what's model correspond to the reality uh, 
in terms of the premises of the model. Can I also, can I also <laughs> take advantage of the, the, the microphone being here to ask a, uh, one question first to Shireen. Um, um, I was just curious when you were mentioning the difficulty of ranking jatis, whereas it's reasonably easy to rank the sort of official government categories. Once you look within those categories, it's not that easy to rank them. Is that actually true also if you were to go down to the village level, like within a village, wouldn't would there be a fairly clear ranking amongst within the amongst the villagers themselves? Would they have a fairly uh, a good understanding of, of the ranking of the jatis within the specific village? Um, so that was the question. And and for for Dominique, I had a question. In the literature, that early literature that you referred to on India and widows, there was this big a lot of emphasis given to the the differential status between widows who were by themselves as opposed to widows who had adult sons. It seems as though having an adult son uh, 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 was very helpful to, uh, for a widow in terms of escaping uh, poverty. Uh, and that was because of this, uh, the ability to rely on the son's help. And I was just wondering whether in Africa you observe something similar, that there's differential sort of uh, status of, of, of widows depending on their children and their dependents and their ages. My comment is to Shireen, and uh, Shireen, I do think that you are being a bit too modest with your results. Um, uh, you know what my previous commentator had said that, uh, is it possible to rank jatis within these broad categories? I think within Bihar it is. Just looking at a, uh, just looking at the graph that you showed me, showed earlier about um, labor force participation of uh, uh, different jatis, the Musahars are actually at the bottom of the category, and that's where you see uh, the highest labor force participation. So if you, uh, this is followed by the Chamars, then by the Dusads. So uh, if you can, um, you know, uh, get this at least by the broader category of Dalits and Mahadalits, I think your, your um, the, uh, you know, results will be so much more richer, and they'll be able to speak much more to exactly the point that you are you are saying. It's just a minor comment from me. Exciting question. I try to answer the best way I can. Uh, the only way I can do is to my intellectual approach how I came to to that issue. I was attending a conference uh, in New York at the United Nations UNICEF, I think, yeah, UNICEF, uh, which had this uh, fighting female genital mutilation as a main objective. At the, that meeting, Maki was there, and they explicitly referred to the theory that is represented by the first coordination game. Yeah, so, and interestingly, I met the NGOs who are acting on that theory to intervene. And this is where I met the people from Tostan and decided to go to the field, etc., and see that. In a sense, I had, you know, I was not completely convinced that things were so simple. Uh, no, uh, when I, I was on the field uh, and I uh, understood the approach of Tostan, I found that they were giving a, a fantastic test of the coordination game, the simple coordination game, which is this public declaration. Because really that should act. You know, you, you are just saying in front of everybody, I abandoned the practice. So you are reassuring the others who should not like the practice to follow you. It's like a sequential game, if you know, it has the same effect, that the, the nasty Nash equilibrium disappears. And I was thinking, if really this game has a value, or this approach, this theoretical approach, we should find that these public uh, declarations uh, have an impact. Uh, so, th that, uh, so, yes, I started from theory, then was, of course, uh, disappointed by the result, and then tried to say, okay, but uh, they can still be, if uh, there is heterogeneity, and we found that there is heterogeneity, uh, uh, we can still kind of rescue this, uh, uh, this approach. But I agree with you that it's still very difficult to disentangle whether it's the bargaining uh, uh, theory or the heterogeneous game coordination thing that, that appears. But if you are able to show that people are not so keen on following others, uh, then you could, you could remove this, uh, you know, approach. It's more difficult to disentangle the bargaining theory and my, you know, my theory with Wahaj and Aldachev, where there is a customary authority. And 
you know, even so, there are some ways of doing that, uh, and uh, I could speak about that. But no, in a sense, I want to add something that is, an, uh, you know, uh, an answer, not an answer, but uh, a comment on the question of, uh, of Betty, is that it's extremely difficult to test the assumption. You know, and I tell you that when Tostan showed me the evaluation study, badly done, I agree. But you know, it's based on direct question to the people of uh, before and after, uh, you know, are you for or against, uh, uh, you know, uh, cutting the daughter, etc. And I, I just couldn't believe those. I seem, uh, on such sensitive matters, you don't go with uh, just naive questions like that, you know, it makes no sense. And in fact, I trusted more the study because we were thinking, how do you know that the people you're talking to have cut their daughters or no? Will they tell you the truth? You know, it's a very difficult question. And the, the way I found was the following. I, the, uh, you know, we didn't ask the question. We didn't ask, did you cut your daughter or no? You straight away say, at what age did you cut your daughter? And those who didn't come say, no, no, we didn't do it. But very few of them say that. And most of them would directly say, you know, when she was four years, when she was six years, when she, so we recorded the age. But in many kinds of study on female genital, most of them, they just ask straightforwardly the question. But can we trust that? So, you know, in a sense, we are in, a, in, in this question on social norms. I don't think you have many other ways than looking at outcome and saying whether they are compatible with theory. And as I say, uh, even that is difficult because sometimes several theory can be compatible with a single fact. But for instance, no, just to finish uh, with the theory of the customary authority, uh, one of the predictions of the theory is that you should never have a total abandonment of a customary practice. It should be partial. That the theory says that. That if there is a recommendation to say to stop cutting daughter or, or you know, to, to marry your daughters later or whatever, to change the succession or inheritance law, you should find that there is an accommodation that is done by customary authority. And in a sense, there are some papers which show exactly that, who show, for instance, and I believe in that because I have seen that on the field so often in Africa, is that, uh, you know, for instance, no, the daughter will not really inherit, but she will be compensated. For instance, in Ghana, there's been the PNDP law saying that the girl should inherit uh, and there are shares that are spelled out by the law. And it is not true that the law had no effect, but you see that there's been some way going towards giving some rights of women, not a squarely succession right, but the compensation. And we have evidence on India in, in the same. That goes very much in the line of our theory. But again, we have to be careful. So to this question of, you know, can you rank jatis, I think, you know, so your question, Vidisha and um, Pete are similar, you know, you're saying, can you rank them at the village level? I think the answer is yes, but I'm going to qualify it and say, what I meant in the presentation is there's no pan-Indian system of ranking jatis. I think there are systems to rank them locally. But they're highly, they're highly contested, right? So it's not easy to rank them, even within a particular village. What metric you use, you know, there's um, the famous sociologist Ian Srinivas who talked about dominant castes. Do you use numbers? Do you use ritual status? Do you use wealth? Like, I think the criteria are many. And I think the important thing for India is that these are fluid. Right? And even after the Government of India Act, where you have SC, SD, I think they remain fluid in terms of how people talk about it, how people frame it, and they're constantly being negotiated. So I agree that in the context of Bihar, you could have Dalits and Mahadalits, you could do that. Um, and, you know, we talk about that in the paper, and I know Rohini Somnathan has, has done some work on this, and it's very good. To, to think that way. I think the only point we wanted to make is that this is quite nuanced, even at this aggregate level. So if you go down to an even more granular level, the nuances will just grow, if, if anything. So, but on the Dalits and Mahadalits, yes, I think you're right. The Musahars, the Chamars, but even there, I would say you look at the Yadavs, you look at the Chamars, you know, these are contested rankings. Even politically, you see this play out in terms of whose community is more worthy of, you know, um, reservations and so on. So that I, we didn't open that can of worms, you're right. But, but our point is purely that it's nuanced. So I'll stop there.
Peter, um, thanks. Yes, totally. Uh, having a son is, is uh, crucial. So because under the Muslim religion as practiced in most of Africa, uh, it, a son you know, inherits more than the daughters and certainly part of the land and so on. So the, if the son's young, the woman can be, continue to, to farm that land until he's old enough. So that's one issue. And then under, and I think the rest of Africa, it's true too. Um, in, in fact, the, one of the papers I mentioned um, on behavioral responses shows, it's a paper in the JDE by Sylvie Lambert and uh, Pauline Rossi, where they basically show that women whose children, whose husband has other children and hence rivals for the inheritance of her own children and don't, doesn't, don't have a son, go to you know, extreme lengths to have one. So they do all these dangerous things like you know, very, very short uh, spacing and very little um, breastfeeding of the, of the daughters in order to have a son. So as kind of insurance against widowhood. And they find very strong, strong effects. Thank you.